Here is the church, here is the steeple, open it up, and oh my gosh, it's full of skeletons. Hi folks, welcome to Glitter Void Gamecraft. My name is Eric, and today I'm building a chapel with removable roof and roof features, as well as stained glass. The chapel the Little C Church, the temple. This is definitely one of the most important buildings, not necessarily to the players themselves, but to the citizens of your average pre-industrial rural society. To the players, it's all sorts of things. The locations for quest givers, where contacts and informants for paladin and cleric types, a place to take refuge from evil monsters, or even the source of that corruption itself. And if you don't play fantasy games, it's excellent scatter terrain for virtually any terrain in virtually any time period. You could either just change up some of the embellishments to make it more appropriate for the time period, or just say it's very old. And this is going to be the first in a mini-series that I'm calling Religious Structures. Alright, let's build this old church. Now, this build will be a small town religious structure. Think village chapel rather than a big cathedral. The trick is to make something tactically interesting, but still a building that you'd see in your everyday travels. I'll have a separated narthex, look it up, it's a real word, at the entrance, while at the other end of the sanctuary, there will be a small alcove for the goodly cleric to preach from, or a place for the cult leader to make sacrifices at. The roof, of course, will be removable, and I'll have some sort of feature, a spire, a bell tower, something to make it stand out. Making the roof feature removable allows it to be swapped out for something else to make the building more versatile. The windows on either end will be stained glass, but that will be removable by making the wall segment on those ends triple thick and leaving a cavity for the glass piece to sit inside. My main reason for having the stained glass be removable was to allow the chapel to be used as a ruin or abandoned building and what would be broken or looted faster than some stained glass. Learning from my farmhouse build, I want the inside playable, but part of that involves making sure that the floor space isn't taken up with walls. Setting all the walls to sit outside the floor space preserves the interior play area, but means that I have to measure carefully. This piece was simple as there is only one interior wall, but that means that the floor piece is 13 inches long, plus the thickness of the foam I'm using for the interior wall. For most of this, I'm using dollar store foam cord board, the cheap kind where the paper rips off easily. Let's get cutting. One of the biggest concerns I had going into this was whether the walls would stay together. I did my best to make sure almost every wall overlapped another. I taped the wall segments together with the overlap so I could test fit the pieces, which worked out just fine. I created a template for the windows using a scrap of foam and traced it onto the walls. I left the various wall pieces together while cutting to make sure the window holes lined up. I didn't trust myself to be precise enough in my measuring to cut two holes on two pieces and have them line up enough. I just put on a fresh blade and got to work. Since the walls were three layers thick, and since I didn't want to cut through the middle layer where the front door would be, I pushed pins through at the corners and the pinholes acted as guides for cutting out the outside layers. To add more detail to the entry, I used the cutout doorway piece as a guide and created a thin piece just slightly wider to form the door frame. I hemmed and hawed about what to do with the stained glass piece that opened into the back of the sanctuary. It was too small for multiple tall windows, and I didn't want to do a large circle because it would look odd next to all of the harsh geometric patterns I'd already made. I eventually settled on a single large window so I could make more of a stained glass mural rather than just generic panels. To make the slot for the stained glass in the center panel, I needed to make sure that the opening at the top of the wall was as wide as the widest part of the window, otherwise the glass couldn't be removed, or inserted for that matter. In the end, I had to go back and make the slot a little bit wider as the glass section worked better when there was a little bit of an overlap on the edges. With all the cutting done, it was time to create the grout lines for the stonework. I pulled off the protective paper on the outward facing surfaces of the walls and scored in lines with a utility knife. I'm not cutting through, barely more force than the weight of the knife. 
The pattern doesn't matter, but this is where making the walls at least two layers thick comes in handy. If you try this with a single sheet of foam core and the grout pattern lines up exactly, as it should since I used a ruler to mark them, the foam core would be cut clean through or at least so flimsy that it might fall apart under the weight of gathering dust. I added stone texture on all the surfaces using my trusty ball of foil. When I don't get ahead of myself and forget, I prefer to do this before expanding the grout lines. The pressure of the ball can undo all that work. A trick for getting into all the little nooks and crannies is to bend a small nub of your foil ball into a lip or hook. This helps get into tighter spots like the small window, but is also handy if you have a ledge or something that is already glued together because you forgot to texture it first or if a cut creates an untextured edge that's hard to reach. For the planks on the door, I just marked off the center point in the middle layer and carried the pattern out. I ran the planking long as most of the layer was hidden and I didn't want to have the planking come up short at, to the edge of the door. I did the same planking pattern on the floor as well as the small interior wall. For any windows or brick patterns that aren't symmetrical, it's important to keep track of which sides are which or you can end up with unaligned portals. As I worked on the walls, I started marking on the faces that would be glued together so I could quickly ID which side was which. Continuing around the building, the walls were feeling a little plain, so I changed up the top row of bricks into smaller ones just to break up the monotony. For the glass panels, I took some clear plastic packaging that was fairly stiff and used the interior wall segments to trace where to cut. This would of course allow me to remove this if I didn't want there to be stained glass or to, at a future date, make additional inserts with different designs. I did the same thing for both windows. These windows are boring. Let's make some embellishments. I traced out some oversized border pieces to sit outside the window frames. To layer up some detail, I attached small squares to the corners and then smaller squares still inside those. For the side windows that aren't removable, I wanted something that was more versatile, so I made bars using toothpicks. To keep them lined up while the glue dried, I flipped over a small piece of tape and then applied dabs of glue at the intersections. When they dried, the horizontal bars were wedged into the window frame, and the whole thing was sandwiched between the two wall sections. I attached the wall segments with hot glue. Hot glue is great because it's very strong and sets quickly, but it can add thickness to the pieces if you aren't careful. For precisely measured builds like this, I try to keep pressure on for a few seconds until the glue has cooled, and then remove any that has gooshed out between the pieces. Keeping pressure on is especially important on the side walls where the bars of the windows are actually pushing the interior and exterior walls apart. When I started laying the walls, I realized I had made a small mistake. The protruding border on the doors wasn't something I had planned originally, so the floor didn't account for that. An easy fix, I just cut off a hunk of the border, the depth of the floor, so that it rested on top of the floor piece, and filled in the gap inside the door with a cutaway. I attached the walls with tacky glue and held them in place with pins while it dried. At this point, I am not attaching the walls to the floor. I'm just using it as a guide. It's a huge pain to reach inside a building to paint. In my very first build on this channel, I made this mistake and had to cut a hole in the floor so I could reach some of the downward facing edges. Once all the glue was dried, I found another issue. At one juncture, the pieces had pulled apart in a way that caused a major weakness. Luckily, that spot was exactly the width of a BBQ skewer. I cut it to length, glued a bunch of glue on it, and pushed it into place. The wall joints needed some cleaning up so I'd be able to fit the decorative corner pieces on. I trimmed off any overhanging edges with my X-Acto knife and started working on the corners. These were made from half inch beams of XPS insulation foam with a notch taken out for the corner to tuck into. This serves to hide the joints between the foam core of the wall segments, as well as to just make the building look sturdier. I attached the corner pieces with tacky glue and pinned them while they dried, pushing the pins into the grout lines to keep them hidden. Measuring the roof substructure ended up being pretty simple. The length of the wall by the length of the triangle roof brace, with one roof piece being longer by the width of the foam core, just to allow for the overlap. Once the pieces of the main roof were attached, I created smaller pieces for the roof over the altar and narthex. 
I left these separate until the very end as I was worried about the process of adding shingles warping the structure and I could correct for that in the end by tweaking how the three roof segments attach together. The worst part of every build, the shingles. Someday I'm going to build a shingle elemental to represent how much I dislike this step. Nothing difficult, just super tedious. I cut squares of cardstock, just some repurposed food packaging. Half inch strips get some texture added with a knife and then cut into roughly half inch squares. Don't measure the second cuts, variation is good. Repeat until you have approximately a trillion and then the real tedium begins. Using white PVA glue, lay the row of shingles. Make sure they overlap the edges, then start a second row, offsetting it by about half a shingle and overlapping the previous layer. I mean, I like how this roof style looks, but yeesh, at what cost? I made sure that the shingles didn't overhang on the sides of the smaller roof segments that would end up being glued to the main roof since they would just get in the way. A parting shot at shingled roofs, I was on autopilot and did an entire side before I remembered that I was supposed to make a platform for the removable bell tower. So instead of cutting through nice pliable foam, I had to hack through two or three layers of cardstock to make the spot for the tower. I measured two points from the peak of the roof on either side and started hacking. The dried glue was particularly hard to cut through and I didn't want to get impatient and cut wild, risk cutting myself, or worse, the roof. I wanted to save the removable segment so I could use it to cover the platform if I wanted a chapel with no roof feature. I didn't worry about making the platform pretty since it would always be covered by one of the removable pieces. I just used scraps of foam to form the base and then found some triangle pieces to fit into the corners. I also reinforced all the joints inside the roof with hot glue. Making the removable roof feature was mostly a matter of taste. If you make a simple base large enough to cover the platform and at least as tall as the peak of the roof, you can do whatever you want. A bell tower, a spire, a dome, a balcony. Get crazy with it. I used scraps from the doorways to make a gabled tower, look it up, also a word, and cardstock for the window frames and shutters. Lots of little cuts, tons of edges for paint and dry brushing to catch, which would make for a nice finished texture. The hardest part of this was the roof. So many intersecting angles. I eventually saved myself a bunch of trouble by scoring and folding the roof segments at the peaks so I wasn't trying to cut and glue pencil lead wide edges of cardstock to each other. A final detail before I get to painting is to make some of the stones cracked. Nothing fancy, just carved in some random lines with a pencil to keep the stonework from looking too uniform. I gave everything the usual Mod Podge mixed with black craft paint base coat. Adding some water, either directly or with a damp brush, helps the base coat flow into the cracks and the details. The Mod Podge hardens and protects the foam and the black paint serves as the base coat to build up all the other colors from. I used brush on surface primer for anything that didn't take the Mod Podge mixture well glossy side of the food packaging, exposed hot glue. I also used this inside all the slots for the stained glass and just general touch-ups where the first pass didn't reach. The stonework was my usual base coat of dark gray with a few blocks of different base colors for variation, then a dry brush of light gray. You can check out some of my other videos where I go into more detail for this step. I also went darker with the wood using a base coat of brown and highlighting with golden brown. After all that stonework, I decided to get wild with the shingles. I chose a marvelous shade of cheesy puff orange and immediately panic as the cheap craft paint was super translucent and looked awful. A second coat improved the coverage, but at this point it was practically glow in the dark. I set this aside to dry, hoping that washes would save it. My next painting foible was with the brass accents. I skipped the base coat as I was worried about how well my cheap metallic craft paint would cover. My worries were well founded as the first coat was so see-through that it didn't even hide the pencil lines on the cardstock. Annoyed at the loss of time, I went back over with everything with a surface primer and that's when something magical happened. The cheap gold paint made the primer go on unevenly but in a really unusual way that almost made it feel like a black gold metallic. A dry brush of the same cheap gold made a nice rich gold that was almost too pretty for this piece. 
I toned everything down with a silver dry brush. I'll have to remember this technique when I make a treasure room or a palace. Jazzed that this went so well, I returned to the roof and washes. My brown did basically nothing. While I waited for it to dry so I could try plan B, I used the black on the rest of the chapel. Stone, metal, wood, the lot. Next time I mix up some brown, I'm gonna go way darker. I spent too much time waiting for this one to dry, only to have to redo it. I mixed a small batch of a super dark brown wash using acrylic inks. My faith in washes was well placed. As soon as this started going on, I knew it was going to be okay. The orange was toned down to more of an autumn and made the spaces between the shingles stand out. Everything got a dry brush of suede as the final highlight. Normally I would do an even brighter highlight, but the roof was dark enough that the suede was plenty bright, and I thought that a dark roof with bright stonework would feel just a little bit off. I attached the metal accents with PVA glue, adding some black to the inside of the bell tower windows to create the illusion that there was something behind it. Once I got the larger pieces in place, I weighted them down with a book. I made sure there wasn't too much glue, as I didn't want to come back to find the book glued to the structure. Attaching the floors was simple, save for a bit of bowing in the wall. This prevented the edges from touching, so the glue wouldn't dry to anything. A few heavy objects pushed the wall in just enough for everything to dry together. To paint the stained glass, I first created a paper insert to sit behind the glass so I could sketch a design on it and trace onto the glass. I made sure to use a vibrant enough color to ensure that this would be visible on camera. Using various washes because of their transparency, I blocked out the different colors roughly. This looks really dumb at first since it's just loops of color. The shape and design will be refined later. A tricky part about doing this with washes is that you have to let each color dry before you do any adjacent colors. Washes like to mix together like watercolors and I wanted distinct colors in the final product. I put some gloss Mod Podge on both sides of the glass to create a glossy but textured surface, almost like frosted glass, and to seal in the dried washes. They don't bond to unprimed plastic very well, so don't be shy with this. Once that dried, I got to work drawing in the lead lines. I chose to do this after the Mod Podge, so the lines would help differentiate the panels, both by color and by them being matte black on top of the gloss finish. A handy trick if sketching is not your strength and or you have some gaps between colors is just make your lines thicker to make the borders nice and crisp. I glued the roof segments together, making sure that they weren't drying on top of the building, and then got to use my Secret Santa gift, some real flocking from Woodland Scenics. I took PVA glue mixed with some water and started painting it anywhere I thought moss might grow. I shook a healthy amount of the flocking onto the glue and tapped it down with my finger and after it had a moment to dry, shook the excess off. Anything that doesn't stick can be saved and reused. Everything got a coat of spray matte varnish, except the stained glass. Besides possibly sticking the glass to the window sills, it would ruin the gloss effect and it's not necessary since a thick layer of Mod Podge is practically a varnish in itself. And voila, a chapel with removable tower and stained glass features. This is a perfect boss battle zone, either assaulting the stronghold of a crazy cult leader, or taking refuge in the most secure building as the necromancer and their hordes advance. The narthex wall gives you more than just a big room to fight through, and the various high points outside give multiple places for you or your enemies to shoot from. You can also add verticality by using some sort of platforms, like the ones from the guard towers I built in the very first video. Everyone's always creating or restoring frescoes and whatnot. Why not in our fantasy world too? An accidental bonus for making the roof feature removable is the storage of the piece becomes much easier. If the tower is small enough, you can just pop it inside the building when you don't have a need for it. And just for fun, I threw together a couple proof of concept for other roof features. A spire, 
and this is supposed to be a dome of some kind. Boom, 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 boom. Go into the chapel and we're gonna have a boss fight. Well, whatever pantheon you follow, or if none at all, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up. This mini-series is going to be a lot of fun. I have a couple more ideas that I'm going to use to flesh out the traditional religious structures, and then a couple of less traditional ones. So, look forward to that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.